Yeah, so we're on part eight. We've got two more parts after this for uh, the book of Proverbs. Um, and this one I've named Reflecting God's Glory, chapters 30 and 31. Uh, this is going to be an interesting one. We'll see how uh, our marriage does after I've finished the last section of Proverbs 31. Uh, and <laughs> we'll see how that works out, and I'll update you next week. Uh, I think things will be fine. Uh, but I'll explain what 31, the end of 31, this is where we talk about uh, the, the, what we might say in more, uh, in more modern phrases, the, 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 the perfect wife is what is being said in Proverbs 31. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, this is going to be interesting. But I, I think I've discovered... Uh, personally through reading it and just really getting to grips with what it means uh, that I'm not doing it to curry favour with women and wives in that sense. I'm not trying to give you the word so I don't get attacked for it, uh, but I think uh, the context is already there and I think we probably look at it wrong actually when we look at Proverbs 31. Uh, and so I'm going to get to that, the, probably the meatiest part of, these, of this section. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to look at um, two things. But Proverbs 31 first, we look at that. It's the sayings of Agar, son of, I think it's Jacob. Uh, his identity is unknown. Uh, his name occurs nowhere else in the Bible. Uh, Agar's words is the stress he lays on humility. So he's all about humility. He's all about being humble before God. Uh, it contains the words of King Lamel in Proverbs 31. Uh, based on teaching he received from his mother about wise kingship. So even then, we get in the, uh, initially we start with the father's words, and then we're going to have mother's words. Uh, so anyone that calls the Bible sexist uh, needs to read the Bible. Uh, God's very fair uh, in having these, this great advice from very wise people, men and women alike. No one knows who Lamel was or where he was uh, king, uh, most suppose that he was not even an Israelite. Um, in 30 and 31, the whole book, the instruction of two um, otherwise unknown sages, as it were, expands the scope of what it means to fear the Lord. So we're still continuing in to understand what is the fear of the Lord and to reflect his glory in our calling, in their calling and, and today in our calling. Proverbs 30 trying to give you a sort of really good breakdown because I'm not, I'm not going to go through every single verse, so trying to give a good background to this. It's a collection of wisdom uh, from the man only, a man known only to this chapter of the Bible, uh, where men of Hezekiah gathered uh, what we learned last week, what we saw last week, additional material for Proverbs 25. They added these words of Agar, so the same people added these words of Agar, uh, and we have, then we have no other mention of Agar at all. Um, and in Proverbs 31, we don't know anything about King Lamel. We don't really know what he's, um, what he's about, what he does. That we, this is the only time we see it. He's not recorded in any list of the kings uh, of Judah or Israel. So he was probably a pagan king, but who put his trust in God, put his trust in the Lord uh, and the covenant God of Israel. And through the fear of the Lord, he learned wisdom. So there's a kind of background as to what we're looking at today. Uh, the two main things we're looking at is sufficiency and responsibility. So this is in relation to reflecting God's glory. We need to be, uh, we need to understand that it's, Jesus is sufficient, but we have responsibility in reflecting God's glory. It's not, uh, we're, trying, we're, we're, we're trying to walk this fine line of saying, it's not about working, you're not trying to earn your way into heaven, but at the same time, our responsibility is to be as, as much as we can living to Jesus, living as much as he wanted us to live in this life. So these are the two things we're kind of looking at here. And that's, um, I would say, probably in those books, efficiency is Proverbs 30, 31, is then we look at more responsibility. Let's look at our first few verses here, 1 to 4. Proverbs 30, 1 to 4 says, The sayings of Agar, son of Jacob, an inspired utterance. Uh, uh, the man's utterance to, I think it's, that's an L, isn't it? Methyl. It's Methyl. I am weary, God, but I can prevail. Surely I'm only a brute, not a man. I do not have human understanding. I have not learned wisdom, nor have I attained to the knowledge of the Holy One. 
who has gone up to heaven and come down, whose hands have gathered up the wind, who has wrapped up the waters in a cloud, who's established all the ends of the earth. What is his name and what is the name of his son? Surely you know. He's sort of shouting a little bit there, by the way. Humble man. Uh, last week I was at, uh, many of you know I was at North Heath, which is why I wasn't here, um, preaching uh, Steve, who is the leader there. Uh, he went on holiday, so uh, I was um, quite happy to go and help him out. Um, and the verses we uh, I preached on there was actually in Acts 4. Uh, and they were, they're going through Acts at the moment. Specifically, the moment with Peter and John. And they're brought in front of the Sanhedrin. Uh, and where, what struck the Sanhedrin when they looked at them was that these men were uneducated. They were unschooled, ordinary men. Their humility, as we looked at, was actually an important aspect of their character. Uh, they could not claim in themselves that what they did was them. They had to keep proclaiming Jesus in everything that they did. They had no knowledge or technical teaching to lean on. Instead, they submitted themselves to Jesus and the Holy Spirit. The Sanhedrin even knew uh, that they had been with Jesus. It was part of how they were identified. So they, they saw them. They, they looked at them and they knew they'd been with Jesus. And so last week I was talking to the church and saying there has to be some aspect of, of that about us. They have to know, people have to know we've been, are with Jesus. So Agar, in a similar way, asks these series of questions to himself about God. He says, I'm, I'm no one. Similarly to what we saw when we see in Peter and John, I'm, I'm nobody. And then he says these rhetorical questions. And he knows the answer to them because he's, he's asking them for effect, for impact. But he, he, he wants it to, to speak to his soul. He wants the, the, the pride to go away. He wants, who, who am I compared to this God who's done all these amazing things? This God who can do and has done and will do more. He does it in reference, humility. That he makes these statements and he, he asks these questions. And we see in, in this in Psalm 8 verse 3 to 4. Similarly, like the, the similar sort of question set. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which have set in place. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. Agar does the same as the psalmist. Places himself in the lowest place in comparison to God. He knows, and he is nothing compared to the work of our great Lord. Agar was, was careful not to boast. Not to boast of his spiritual knowledge, of his biblical knowledge. I know as Christians, we can. Uh, I've seen it before, we, there's a, so almost a, an unacknowledged sense of competition about who can remember verses without looking in the Bible. Who can do uh, memory verses the best. I'm terrible. I've got an awful memory. So that memory verse stuff is, is just not, not going to work for me. I have, a, I have a terrible memory when it comes to this. However, I would say that I trust in God and say, Lord, when it's right, just to please put it in my head. Because I, there's at times I've stood up here and there's a verse and I know it and I've, I've kind of frozen and gone, yeah, you know that one, that verse, yeah, that verse right there. That's humility, by the way. That's, oh, hold on. No, now, now it's prideful. Oh, oh, what am I doing? You know, so we, get, we can get caught up in this thing. We need to be really careful. Uh, humility doesn't mean knowing every single word of the Bible, okay? Uh, humility is just submitting yourselves to God and saying, Lord, teach me. Show me where my pride is and please put it to death every day, every single day. So he's careful not to boast. He brings his lesson to us with this great humility, not a position of superiority. And is, it, is an acknowledgement of our limitations in comparison to God and his creation. Which is why I started with such great news of seeing scientists finally maybe looking at the bigger picture as to what's going on. What are we in comparison to this amazing design? How is it we're even here today? How is it we have self-awareness and know exactly 
our place in the universe in that sense. No other being knows or has self-awareness. It doesn't know. You can't talk to an animal, you can't talk to a lion. If it could speak, you wouldn't have the same conversation. It wouldn't even know our terms of reference as human beings. We'd be almost speaking two different languages. Only human beings are self-aware, aware of their environment. But we can only know about his name, about God's name, God's nature, God's character, and his son's name by God's own revelation. And what's the way to do that? Well, it's not certainly to come with pride and say, Lord, I know this, this, and this about you. I've, I've studied, I've got, I've got the master's degree in theology. I've been a Christian for 80 years, 20 years, 100 years, whatever you want to call it. We are never going to stop learning, no matter how long you've been a Christian, no matter how much you've read the Bible, you're never going to stop learning. And in fact, that is the beauty of the Bible. That is the amazing gift of the Word. I can look at the same passage one week, and then the same passage again the next week, and go, I didn't see that last week. I didn't see what God was saying. Then I saw something else. I saw something different. But it, it doesn't change what that verse meant. I would say it's the only book I've read that does that. It is the only book that teaches me something new every time I read it, even if I've read these verses before. So we must humbly depend on God's revelation for our knowledge. It goes on to say, every word of God is flawless. Oh, how so many want to prove it wrong. Every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to these words, to his words, or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. We know we've seen this. You remember this, this warning? Revelation, don't add to this word. God's consistent, Old Testament, New Testament, same God, Old Testament, New Testament, doesn't change, he's not changed his character, he's not a horrible, uh, oppressive God in Old Testament, and a nice, lovely, fluffy God in the New Testament, he's the same God wherever you look at him in the Bible, the same perfect, uh, justice-filled God. To know that revelation of knowledge, to know that every word of God is flawless, we need a good grounding. And so here it is. Every word of God is flawless. And it's a bold statement to make. Especially as we read this with today's eyes and in today's society. It's so easy using man's own logic do we hear that God's word is a contradiction. Or it was only for the time it was written. How amazing that when you look at the Bible, when you look at the character of the people it talks about, it's just exactly the same as what we see today. Because it doesn't matter when the book was written, it was written by God. It was written for all time, for all eternity. And even says God's principle is to pass that down, to keep passing it to the next generation. Temptation is to show that it's not a contradiction or outdated. We sometimes want to get into these arguments and go, well, actually, you know, it's not a contradiction because this, this, and this. It's not outdated because this, this, and this. Yet we need to observe that God will do the proving. God will do the rebuking. Stand on the word. It's very easy, I'm going to say, because I still, you know, can succumb to this sometimes, uh, we get lost in our own knowledge of the Bible sometimes. I think when people come and ask us about things, we, there is a temptation to get a little bit debatey about the Bible. And that's fine. We can have a good open debate, a good open conversation. But we need to be careful that when we're having those conversations, grace has always got to be there. I want them to hear God's word, not my version of it. What you'll often find in the conversations that I've had, certainly with non-Christians, is that they try and pull you away from God's word. They try and distract you away from not talking about that and talking about some other thing that they've come up with in their head about the Bible that they've never read. Go back to the word. What does the word say? What does God say to know that 
we must be able to hear him, to read about him. So there is this balance of how we proceed in our walk of faith, especially as we want to know more about God and gain more knowledge. Nothing wrong with gaining knowledge about the Bible. Nothing wrong with gaining knowledge about God. But there is an acceptance that must be part of the Christian life. The mind will demand more. And it's not entirely wrong. It's not entirely wrong. But this must be tempered by the attitude of the heart that's also willing to accept God in as much as he is available and in his completeness seen in the word. So we have our minds. God's given us a fantastic gift of a mind that can understand, perceive, read, store up, use knowledge. But then it must be tempered by a heart that is submissive, in submission to God. Because otherwise the mind runs away with it. The mind controls what we do. The mind does everything that we, that we probably shouldn't be doing, that doesn't honour God. So when you really get into this, especially when we're looking at Agar, this is, his, this is the way humility works. It's a battle every time. He says these things out loud in these questions because he wants his flesh to know you're not in charge. His mind, you're not in charge. God's in charge. Holy Spirit is in charge. Submit to him. Uh, I've got this quote here from Garrett. He says, the temptation is to improve on the text, if not by actually adding new material, then by interpreting it in ways that make more of a passage, passages teaching than is really there. It is what Paul called going beyond what is written. And that's what we do, right? I mean, we, we could do it and everything, but we go beyond uh, what we're told sometimes. And in, in, I would say in this age, this time, people don't think that Jesus is enough. They don't think that even the revelation of the Bible in its current, uh, it, as it is now, is enough. They want, they want to find new ways to try and get to Jesus. They want to uh, push themselves. I was, I was watching this video and nothing wrong with the Holy Spirit, by the way. Nothing wrong with praising in the Holy Spirit. But I saw this, uh, watched this video of this church in the US. Um, and it has me in stitches because, and it's also sad as well. Um, it, it's a very, very, how can I say this? I don't know if it's spirit-filled. It, it, was, it was very much on the side of let's just lose ourselves. Let's lose our heads. Let's really go for it. Let's not even, let's not even ground ourselves. Let's not control ourselves like the Bible tells us to. Let's just lose ourselves in the moment. And so all these people have just lost themselves in this moment. They're all crying and wailing and all sorts. And this guy at the front, he stands there and he says, and, it, and the music sort of comes. They're using music to, you know, influence you. Music comes down, comes to an end. He stands at the front. He says, four more minutes. Four more minutes, he says. Church, this, that isn't the Holy Spirit. It isn't an army drill to praise God. It isn't a struggle to, to get to him. He's not death. The Holy Spirit as a Christian lives within us. He's right here. You're being much like you standing in front of me and I'm shouting at your, in your face. Why do we lose ourselves in these things? Yes, lose yourself in the Holy Spirit, but the Bible tells us we must be controlled in worship, orderly in worship, because we lose our reverence otherwise. And then we seek more. I want more than just what the Bible says. I want more than what Jesus did. I want more than the cross. I want more than the death. More than the resurrection. don't need to it's done it's finished believe in jesus you're saved so we need to ask ourselves here am i willing to let god be who he says he is without overly deconstructing every single aspect of who he is or what he is again nothing wrong with investigating and, and, and relishing the knowledge of the word. But I know this, this latest thing of deconstructionism is, is destroying people's faith. 
Not because, oh, they've seen the lie behind it. It's because they're, they're creating lies behind it. They take one line and then they deconstruct it so much that it's not what they originally started with. We need to be careful. We need to trust God. Are we willing to hand that over to him? Am I content in trusting God at his word? Is Jesus enough? But it isn't enough to know every word of God is flawless if we don't take the next step and trust that the very word is the shield that will protect us. Trust in what is enough. Goes on. Seven to nine. Two things I ask of you, Lord. Do not refuse. Although there's, there's three, I think. But he says two. Do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Verse 9, otherwise I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or may become poor and still and so dishonor the name of God. It speaks right into this strange thing we have today where, where churches are teaching in some respects, get more. God wants to make you rich. God wants to make... Where's the humility? Agar says, treat me right. You know me. You know my heart. You know I can handle much or if I can handle little. Keep me in the right place. And I've said this a few weeks ago when I said, the reason why some people might not be rich and some people might not be poor is because God knows our heart. He knows what we can take. He knows what we can withstand. He knows what we can manage. Hard lesson, I think, either way. But do we trust that God is enough? But here it is, simplicity in these verses is the theme. Not only does Agar want the word to be sufficient, he asks God that he gives him the right balance in living rightly towards him. Not too easy, not too hard. And we do pray that, don't we, Lord? Oh, Lord, we pray for things, Lord. Oh, come in power and great. But I may not be ready for how hard that might be. So, Lord, don't make it too hard, okay? Don't make it too, too complicated. Don't make it too stressful for me. That's fine. Agar, ask the same. Just don't make it too hard. He still wants to be an ambassador for God. He still wants to show that he absolutely believes in him. Do his mission. But it's okay to pray, Lord. Don't make it so hard on me that I fall. That's what I got saying. Don't, don't make it so hard that I actually turn away from you. Don't make it too easy that I just become too comfortable. It's an okay prayer to have. It's in the Bible. And, and Agar's all right. Agar's fine. He says, keep me within touching distance of you, Lord. The right side of right and the right side of wrong. So the desire here is for Agar to be satisfied by what God would provide him. I have a, another quote here. We instinctively want to honour and even protect the name of our God, even if our God is an idol. This statement of Agar showed that in some, the glory of God, not his personally, motivates Agar's requests. It's not his personal need, although he wants to be in a position to continue to have trust and faith in God. So he says, Lord, treat me with delicate hands. Not too much that I might get prideful and not need you, as it were. But not too little that I get angry at you and, and disown you and, and not want to walk in your way. It's a revelation about himself. He's saying, that's me. That's, that's the guy I am. I can do that. I can walk away because, hey, what have you done to me, Lord? Or I can walk away because, well, why do I need you? He, he speaks into the human nature of what we are now. I would say the struggle within our, our community, in some respects, not everyone, but within our community is that people have enough. People have what they need. Why, why do I need God? I've got everything. I've got a house. I've got everything I need. I'm set up for life. Well, you're set up for this life. Anyway, 
But that's the challenge we have here in this community. Now, whether that will change, and I think it probably will, as we see the, the, the prices go up and cost, cost of living go up, and then we'll get people hiding in secret, not, not wanting to reveal that they're in trouble, they're struggling. But that's how it goes, isn't it? We, we want to hide that when it doesn't look good. We don't want to come out and ask for help. And the church is here for that. The church is here for people to come, be a safe space for people. Let's move on. The leech's two daughters in 1516. Give, give, they cry. There are three things that are never satisfied. Four that never say enough. The grave, the barren womb, la uh, land which is never satisfied, water and fire which never says enough. Uh, enough is the term here. Enough is the context of what he's talking about here. He speaks of the generations that have this desire to devour everything and anything. And that there seems to be no end to this greed of wanting more. Again, when, I, when we talk about the Bible, we're saying, is the Bible out of date? My word is the Bible, the most up-to-date book when you look at this and then you look at society now. Generations being taught that you must desire the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. How can you ever say the Bible is out of date? What is behind these examples is the nature of being a parasite, continually drawing and taking, never satisfied, never enough. It is a picture of human greed. As we've been looking at in the earlier verses, when we don't look to the sufficiency of God's word and treat it as sufficient, we look elsewhere to fill these gaps. Everything else, however, will not quench that thirst. No matter how much we look for, no matter how much we feel that it's doing its job, ultimately we'll look for something more and more. God's word, however, says you have enough. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 5 says not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves but our competency comes from god our confidence our everything sufficiency is the other translation to competence he is sufficient we, we're not sufficient in ourselves but our sufficiency comes from god so we need to understand that we need to command the flesh the mind and the heart under the the, the direction of the word we need to remind ourselves that we have limitations oh how the world does not want to tell you uh, that you have limitations you can do and achieve whatever you like well you can achieve some things you can put your mind to it and you can achieve certainly many things in this world but let's be clear we have limitations for instance we cannot save ourselves very basic christian concept you can do many things, but you can't save yourself. Only God can do ever so much more beyond our limitations. In the same way, we don't need to seek to delude ourselves into thinking we can go beyond them if we just try a little harder. Just try a little bit more, a little bit more. It's, it's, uh, let, me, let me put it this way. That concept is circular. And what I mean by that is if you keep thinking, push a bit more, push a bit more, and I think I spoke about this, spiralling, I think we'll burn ourselves out. I remember back when, um, uh, when the stock market was full of people, had floors, and that's all computer run. There's no one on the floor anymore. Everyone's sitting at a computer now. But when they, they, they were stood on the floor... And you ever, especially if you saw it in uh, New York in the stock exchange, you saw pictures of that film of that. These some of these guys were sort of you know dead by fifty, you know because they're just pouring themselves into getting more and more, a little bit more, push again, push again. The stress of that, the where does it go? Well, ultimately you, you get, you're going to die. It's not healthy for you. I mean, for one, it wasn't healthy for the body, not healthy for the mind. Where are they going? Where are they going after they pass? What, what happens when they don't take it with them? No one remembers them because they're like one in a million people that were doing this stuff. Sufficiency. 
Is God sufficient? Is God enough? To accept that Jesus and his word is sufficient is to discover a contentment beyond any contentment through work and human effort. Jesus is and should be enough. The word of God is and should be enough. There's simply no complex way to describe it other than saying, if you accept Jesus, that's enough. Live to him, live to his victory, live to his glory. And whatever you do there, you're reflecting to others that you have this amazing faith, imperfect though it is, and that serves people as well, by the way. It will honour God, reflect his glory in such amazing ways. So let's move on to our second point here when we're talking about responsibility. Uh, Proverbs 31. Uh, and so what we need to understand about this one is, whilst we need not strive in our service to God, we should honour him by the way we use the responsibility he has given us to reflect his glory well. Uh, the words of King, King Lamel, as with Agar, uh, uh, we don't know anything about him. And so he's not in any recorded list or anything like that of kings. So uh, this is a potentially a pagan king who came to Jesus, came to God, as it were. Proverbs 31, verse 2 to 3 says, Listen, my son, listen, son of my womb, listen, my son. This is his mother. Uh, the answers to my prayers do not spend your strength on women, your vigor on those who ruin kings. King Lamel's uh, mother spoke to him uh, with this great tenderness, describing her connection with him in three ways. He was simply her son, then the son of her womb, and having given birth to him, finally he was the son of her vows, her promises, her commitment to him. And there is this sense in what his mother says that... Um, is a, a warning against this excessive sexual interest in women. She's warning him that it wastes a man's strength, that it, it's not the way, that if that's the only way you live, if that's what, how you see your whole life, that that's what you chase after, it's not going to be good for you. It speaks of an unhealthy obsession with romance, with sex, which have, a, which have a place in life, of course, godly within what the Bible says, of course. But she warns him that it should not be made into a reason for living. Don't live for that. Don't live for that. It will ruin you. It's the idea that the practice of sexual immorality, sex obsession, gives away a man's strength in the same way of his spiritual strength, his self-respect, his self-control, his example and standing in the community. King Solomon, as wise as he was, at one point, at some point later, was not wise. He was destroyed as he gave his strength away to women, multiple women. But the lesson is, is not, and let me be clear, that women are the forerunners of destruction. Let me be clear. Because it seems like that at the moment, doesn't it? Right? You read this and you go, oh, it's them women, it's them women. Let me condition this, right? Because context, right? I always speak about context, so you, have, you can't pin this on me. Context, okay? What this actually is, is living for something so temporary that it will only ever lead to destruction. So the, the bigger view of this is not specifically about women. Actually, it's about seeking things that are temporary, that don't last, that don't mean anything, that don't end in glorifying God. The same way we look back at what we just learned in Proverbs 30 about the leeches. And again, we find a similar warning of waste in our lives on the futility, again, the bigger picture, of chasing something that will ultimately never completely satisfy forever. And yet society is that, isn't it? It's seeking the next thing. It's only seeking what it can satisfy right now. So, of course, when you're talking about something that people are not even at in their heads, when you're saying about, do you want eternal life? They're thinking, yeah, but what about now? 
so surprised that people are doing what they're doing, right? So surprised that we were doing that. We are tempted by that. Because actually we're kind of told by the world to live in the moment. It's not the same, by the way, as when the Bible says, don't worry about tomorrow. It's not the same thing. I can't go into that right now, but it's a completely different context. Living for God has this amazing uh, kingdom benefit, eternal benefit is what that's talking about. Don't live for tomorrow like you're living temporarily. Live for today as living for God and tomorrow won't matter because you're living for God. That's why this is different. That's why we're, we're not looking at this in the same way. The warning here is to her son not to give in, not to choose the life of futility. And in fact, we do need to be clear. Men need to take responsibility for their actions and the choices they make. She's not trying to excuse her son's behavior and say, watch out for those women, oh, perfect son of mine. Watch out for those terrible women. No, 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 she's not saying that at all. It is for him to take responsibility. So both him and the woman he meets are not brought into sin. We know this because we look back at Adam and Eve, right? Adam stood right there. He did not take up his responsibility to protect his wife. And yet we want people accuse Christians again, oh, you're blaming the woman. Oh, no, I'm blaming Adam. He did not stand up. In fact, he ran away and hid from God. That's no man, is it? And I'm not talking about, like, grow up and be a man. I'm saying be a man of the Bible. Adam's lesson here is that we don't shrink away from responsibility as men. We stand up for it. Take responsibility for our actions. Proverbs 31, 4 to 7 is not for kings, Amel. It is for kings to drink wine. Uh, not for kings to drink wine. Not for rulers to crave beer. At least they drink and forget. What has been decreed and deprive all the oppressed of their rights. Let beer be for those who are, per are perishing, wine for those who are in anguish. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. Talking about temporary again, yeah? Talking about these temporary things that won't last, that won't build you up, that won't make you into anything, that won't help you. It is not for kings to do these things, she's saying. It is not for us to do these things. And I think it perfectly reflects the responsibility, power and authority he will have and will be at his disposal. So be a responsible king. How often are we seeing people not take ownership and responsibility for their actions? How many politicians can we reel off who are not respecting the authority given to them by God? to lead and to govern. It's a sad state of affairs. And I'm not signing, this happens all across the world, by the way. I'm not, I'm not trying to get political about the UK government. I'm saying this happens in every single country. How many are disrespecting the authority given to them by God? Because that's what God says. He puts in government. So instead, she says, this is the way to live, he says, she says. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. The idea is that there are those who can't speak for themselves to defend themselves in a court of law or in other places. The wise and godly man or woman will speak for those who cannot speak. Take up the cause of the defenceless. In this case, he has been well advised to use his God-given responsibility to reflect God's glory. Let me be clear. Church is not a social service. We do provide food banks. Our churches certainly provide food banks, but we're not here just to provide the food for now. And I just go back to the Bible again. Jesus said, that's not enough. That's not going to get you where you need to be. Yes, it will feed you, it will fill your stomach right now, but the, the bread of life is him. To live eternally, 
to be completely satisfied, trust in him. Another quote here from Garrett. He says, it is noteworthy that this is her sole political concern. This is the mother. She does not say anything about building up the treasury, creating monuments to his reign, or establishing a dominant military power. For her, the king's throne is truly found on righteousness. Cuts right through the rubbish, right through the politics, and says, all of that doesn't matter. If you're thrown, if, if you don't rule with righteousness from God, it's for nothing. You can read the kings in Kings, the book of Kings, and you can see the failures of kings. Those who didn't trust, who didn't sit on a throne of righteousness, as it were, who did not align with God's purposes. But with that, with the predefining the context of what this advice means for the king and his actions, we look at the advice given to him regarding a wife of noble character. Here is the meaty bit. Proverbs 31, verse 10. Let's begin. A wife of noble character, who can find she is far, worth far more than rubies? There are 22 verses that we'll see. We won't see all of them. We'll, we'll, we'll just skip, you know, sort of scan over them a bit. They each begin, each verse begins with this, a successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And so the purpose was to make this passage memorable, which is incredibly interesting, easier to memorize, in fact. One uh, theologian puts it as an alphabet of wifely excellence. Good, isn't it? And with saying that, let me be clear. This passage is traditionally, I would say, understood as being addressed to women. But it's more accurately spoken by a woman to a man so he could know the character and potential character of a good wife before marriage, but also value and praise his wife for a virtuous character once married. It is primarily a search list for a man, not a checklist for a woman. Does that make sense? Need to look at this right. Look at the text right. This is a mother to a son. That's the context. I absolutely believe what I've, what I've got here. Not a checklist. In fact, what this reflects are values of the woman who walks in the fear of God and seeks godly wisdom. In a similar way that men are called to be of godly character and love as Jesus loves. One does not trump the other. Okay, let me be clear. One does not trump the other. Men and women must take responsibility as godly men and women under God to carry out that responsibility. No one gets away with anything here. And so our verse, a wife of noble character is worth far more than a rubies. The woman described in the rest of the chapter is rare and valuable, but her value is greater than what she does. So when we look at the list of tasks, don't go, I don't do that. Don't say, I don't do this and I don't do that. If we, were to, if we were to bring this up to today, we would just change those tasks to what they are today. Do you understand what I mean? It's not about the task, is my point. All, all we're observing here, because of the context of the time, most certainly these are the very few moments that we look at the context of the time, is he, she's describing a list of things that would be done, but they're not the things that define Her value or worth should not be reduced to the performance of these qualities. It doesn't define a woman. She'll be virtuous before she acts in a virtuous manner. Again, men and women are called to seek high moral standards in line with the word of God. To have and seek wisdom in the way we live to God and to reflect his glory. Ross here, he says, uh, a theologian, he says, since it's essentially about wisdom, its lessons are for both men and women to develop. The passage teaches that the fear of the Lord will inspire people to be faithful stewards of the time and talents that God has given. That wisdom is productive and beneficial for others, requiring great industry in life's endeavors. That wisdom is best taught and lived in the home. 
to everyone, by the way. So home being not the home of what you might think is trying to dress up a traditional wife and husband. You're saying where it starts from is in the home. It begins. And what happens is you, you live out in the tasks that you do, that you carry out, the work that you do. Verse 11 and 12 says her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. Her character is trustworthy, filled with integrity. She will speak, act and live with wisdom. And therefore God's blessing will be on her. Again, this applies to men and women. It is not a checklist. What is amazing about this in regard to a wife that she talks about here is God acknowledging through these words that women bring great, great gain to men. And yet, the pe people accuse the Bible of being out of date. And yet right here, the Bible says that women bring great value to men. Almost you think, oh, this is some woke latest world thing, right? No, 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 no. The Bible teaches right. The Bible's ahead of everyone. What's sad is how many man children you see. I call them man child. No, better way to describe it. They're numbered in age, they're, you know. They've got a, their birthday count is high, should we say, but their wisdom and maturity is not. So the Bible says the age is not really a factor, actually, in, in when it comes to teachers, when it comes to those who will be leaders. It's not about the age, because actually you can have any age still acting like a child, not growing up, not maturing. It's especially so when we see men not stepping up. Especially so when um, I've been around friends in the past and they talk about their wives in such a way that is dishonouring. It's awkward. It's not good to be around those people. They are man children. For them, for some reason, a wife is a burden. For the one who is wise, a wife who values godly wisdom is but gain. Because this chapter is included in the whole Bible, we also know that men and women struggle to attain these qualities. But even if we don't quite get them right, we still value them. Do we value them? Don't checklist your way into this. Go, do I value what's being said here? Because we're going to come to the end of this section and you're going to see what is the main important thing. What is the most important thing these words say? But let's move on to our next set of verses. 13 to 16 says, She selects wool and flax and works of eager hands. She's like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family, portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it out of her own and she plants a vineyard. I look at that and I say, this is, this is advanced. She, she bought a field. In this time, we're arguing whether women, well, they can't do this and that. And yet we've got the Bible that was written, I can't remember when Proverbs was written, a long time ago. We've got someone who's buying a field, who's earning, you know, money and a vineyard and... Oh, sorry, I get so... People say it's always out of date. The Bible was there first. What are you talking about? It's written. But here we're told how a woman works. This is, this is an example-based list not a definitive list. What is meant to show, especially to women, is that God gives recognition to women that their role is big and varied and matters to him, in as much as it matters about men's roles. God values that. It's not the task that make the woman, but her character. This especially so in whatever women do and what we're seeing in these verses. May it serve the Lord first and foremost. 
However imperfect that may be, by the way, again, not a checklist. I'm going to say it again, just as men and their character, they must also aim for doing things in God's glory, reflecting his glory. It's not the job or the task or the work we do that impresses God or that makes us virtuous. It is that all things we do, we try to do in service to God. So it is much about our character and how we reflect God's glory on our lives. 17 to 20, she sets about her work vigorously, her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand she holds the distaff, uh, distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. A noble wife is strong and uses her strength. She is wise in doing so. How strange what we're coming back to is wisdom. We're coming back to wisdom. 21 to 23, when it snows, she has no fear for a household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for a bed. She's clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. The virtuous wife, has wisdom, diligence, and preparation, but just like men, not perfectly. Not perfectly. We are all suffering from the brokenness of this sinful world. Every single person. But as Christians, we desire to want to serve God and honour him. And the reflection of our imperfectness is an acknowledgement that we need Jesus. Jesus. God can see through all the pretty stuff and all the things that look good. He can see through all that. He can see through all the, the front that we put up. He can see through all that. He sees that we're in need of a saviour. This is done through the continued study of the word, seeking the Holy Spirit to guide her right. And so he'll want to say that, yes, there are practical things here that exemplify a woman and her husband. But I'll say this again, it means nothing if all of this is a checklist. If it's to look good to others, if that's the reason that it's done, then it's being wrongly understood. 30 to 31 says, charm is deceptive. This is it. This is the one that holds it all together. Charm is deceptive, beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honour her for all that her hands have done and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. These last verses sums this up. At the end of the day, charm is deceptive. Beauty is fleeting. It's temporary. To charm people with what you do and to present yourselves well outwardly is temporary. It's not going to get you where you need to go. The fact that she truly, in these verses, fears the Lord shows that she had a real relationship with him. Above all else... Men and women get a, a strong relationship with our Lord and Saviour. Above all the work that you might think, even that honours him, first of all, accept Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. Have a good relationship with our Lord. She was not only a Martha, busy with service, she was also a Mary, walking in fear and reverence towards the Lord. That's often taught, isn't it? We're one or the other. Women are one or the other. Mary or Martha, which one are you? That's not the point. <laughs> it's helpful, but it's not the point. The point is walk in reverence to the Lord. God honours the virtuous wife, the woman of wisdom and diligence, and makes her one of the greatest blessings given to humanity. How we don't see that reflected in the world. When I read this word, I'm saying the world is ancient compared to this word. The world is stuck in the past compared to this word. The virtuous woman will be rewarded by God, by the God she fears, rewarded by what she's accomplished for her family, for herself, as they publicly speak of her godliness and wisdom, for the women and the man of wisdom. 
this reward is not their primary motivation. It's not the primary motivation, but the fitting result of their life lived in fear of the Lord. And I think this nicely closes our point in what it means to ref reflect God's glory. We first need to accept the light in order to reflect. That is by understanding that God and his word are sufficient. He is enough. That there is only futility in looking for more than what God has already provided in Jesus Christ. To reflect this, both men and women need to treat carefully the responsibility and gift that God has given us. When we value what God has given us in the sacrifice made through Jesus Christ, we will want to serve God as an outward appreciation of that amazing gift. That reflection of God's glory will firstly honour God, but will then bless others. That is the point of these verses, by the way, in Proverbs. Ultimately, it is firstly to honour God, but he wants to bless others. Others must be have the opportunity to come, but he wants what he does to glorify him to be a, a righteous show, a righteous show of what he believes. That reflection of God's glory uh, will have an effect. Above all else, valuing the high standards of God's word in the Bible shows us how insufficient we are in contrast to Christ. But trusting in God is enough for all our insufficiency to be sufficient in Christ. So all of that stuff when I'm talking about it's not a checklist is so important that you see it that it's not a checklist. That we see from the very beginning of Proverbs 30, it wasn't about how well he did, how much he knew. It was that he trusted God, that I is totally insufficient. And in acknowledging that, he has been made sufficient in Jesus. I am insufficient and I need someone to make me sufficient. And I can't do it myself. Who's there? Jesus. And so I simply say this to finish. Christ is sufficient for us. Let's pray and let's worship uh, as we uh, worship in God's name. Worship him. Lord, thank you. Uh,